Okay. Uh, what was your branch of service? My branch of service was the U.S. Army in the Infantry. What was your highest rank? Sergeant First Class. I was a Ford Observer for a 4.2 Mortar Company, and that required an Assistant Platoon Sergeant at Staff, uh, Sergeant First Class. Okay. Uh, what were some of the general locations that you served? Oh, the general location was North Korea, South Korea, uh, Old Baldy, uh, White Horse, uh, Outpost Harry, uh, other many other places I can't remember. Okay. Um, were you drafted or did you enlist? I was drafted into the U.S. Army. Uh, where were you living at the time? I was living in East Hampton, Massachusetts with my parents. Okay. Uh, do you remember the date that you... No, I do not remember the date I was drafted. How about the date that you left for boot camp? <laughs> Those dates are gone by my memory. My memory isn't that good anymore. I can't remember half the things. Okay. Um, but I was went to this training... And I was training in, uh, uh, I think, was Fort Knox, maybe. And I left immediately after basic training for Korea. Okay. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the training at Fort Knox, what it was like? Uh, it was very good, very intense. I learned how to fire uh, rifles, walk, throw grenades, 45s. Uh, at Fort Knox was an armored school. I even sat in a tank and drove a tank a little distance because Patton, that was one of Patton's favorite places. Okay. And I learned how to fire the rifle, Thompson, uh, not a Thompson, then a grease gun, all the weapons that I needed in combat. Um, how was living conditions at this camp? Living conditions were very, well, they were wooden barracks. We lived in wooden barracks, and I was an acting sergeant at that time, so I had my own section. Uh, so they made me an acting sergeant right when I was in basic training and everything. How did you um, become an acting sergeant so early? They picked me for it, I guess, because I was my length, my time of service, my cap capabilities of telling people what to do. Had you already served previously before? No, I had not served previously before. But I did have a brother that served in World War II in Korea. Okay. Um, your, what was your day-to-day -day like at boot camp? Uh, get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, uh, have breakfast, and then out for training. And it seemed that <laughs> today, probably it's all right, but at that time it seemed that every time we ate, it was never enough. You could always eat more. Yeah. That's because I feel that because the training they put us through drove up our appetite. Right. Our physical training, our uh, phys ed, and our rifles, and it all works. I just feel that gave us the ability to eat more than we. Were you sent uh, to boot camp with anybody for, from your hometown? You no, I would, did not go with anybody from my hometown. In fact, uh, I just made friends. Okay. I was easy to get along with and I capable of meeting people and talking to people. Right. I remember one fella, I can't think of his name, but he had something to do at that time there. It was the Brooklyn Dodgers. So he was something, he was going out with a girl that her parents was something to do with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Well, uh, any memorable experiences from boot camp you'd like to share? No, I can't remember too much from boot camp. Uh, I guess we were on that, uh, I think it's, I don't know the number of the highway, but they used to call it the death highway between Louisville and boot camp and Fort Knox. That's the only thing I know, remember. Okay. And at that time we were segregated. The Army was segregated. Uh, even the bus company was, where you caught the bus to go was, they had their own waiting area and everything. 
And what was that like? I didn't like it very much, and I didn't take the bus that often. No, so I didn't know that much about it, except that when I went into the bus terminal, I noticed it there in Louisville. Was it a lot different than from Massachusetts? Oh, an awful lot. Awful lot. There's quite a bit of difference because there was that segregation there where they had their own places and things. Right. Um, so, how long would you say you stayed at Fort Knox? I would say probably uh, 12 weeks. Okay. And then after that 12 weeks? After that, I went to Korea. Okay. You, um, you went by ship or plane? Or? I went by ship from uh, Camp Stolman, California. That's where they put us up and then they put us on board ship. How long were you there for? Like a day or so? Or? Two days maybe. Okay. Maybe two days at Camp Stolman on the ship. Then we went across and I think, now I'm not positive, but we stopped at one of the islands. And it was one of the islands that we had taken during World War II. And it was a section of the island that uh, the people didn't want to be taken by the Americans. They walked off a cliff someplace. I think that's, I don't know, uh, but I think that's it. Uh, as far as I can remember. Okay. And then I went in and they were, issued me a rifle. I zeroed it in and was, was in Korea. How long would you say it took uh, to get to Korea? <sighs> I would say probably seven days. Okay. Uh, I would say it probably, I don't remember exactly, but I would say it was probably seven days a week. How was it on the boat? Uh, the boat was good. A good job and everything, and uh, of course, uh, I loved the sea. I ended up that I loved the sea, okay. and a lot of guys couldn't take it. They got sick on board ship, but I, I loved it. Yeah. The only thing I didn't like was I didn't like being below the water level. Right. So I used to be in the hallways a lot. Okay. Um, do you remember? Um, what were your first impressions like arriving in Korea? Place stunk. That was my first impression of it. It smelled all over. I had, uh, uh, it, it just, there was nothing there except, you know, we went through Seoul, we went through, like I went through Seoul, I went through other areas, and these are not the first days that I was there, but I remember going through these places, and there was nothing there to, Right. Um, you remember where you landed? Oh, no. Okay. Um, I remember one time we landed at Incheon. We landed in NLSTs. Uh, what was your first assignment when you got to Korea? A rifleman. I carried an M1 rifle with rifle, ammunition, and things. Then I went to a mortar company, a 4.2 mortar company, and I became a forward observer. That time I started going up in rank. Okay. Um, well, let's start with when you were a rifleman. Uh, what was your day to day like with that? Uh, Staying alive, staying in the hole, in the ground, digging a hole, firing my rifle and a group of enemy. That's about it. I was made again a corporal, PFC corporal right there. It takes long. And that was it. My day-to-day -day life, ate sea rations. And somewhere along the line, somebody, one of the guys, 
had received the ham, and I know he carried that ham for a long, a one pound ham that didn't need refrigeration from home. Wow. And he carried that for a long time until we found a place where we could cook it. Nice. Uh, uh, how about the sleeping conditions? Did you sleep right in a tent or? Uh, no, we didn't have a tent. We had shelter hats, but we didn't set them up. We slept in our holes in the ground in our foxholes. Okay, and it was like it for the whole time. To the times I was there and with the rifle company. Okay. When I moved to a mortar company, when I first moved to a mortar company, they were in a, a position. They had like bunkers moved up, and we slept in bunkers then. And then I moved up to the front line to for the for observer. And I had a bunker up there. Uh, what were some of the areas that you saw in Korea with the rifle company? Oh. You know, <laughs> there was Baldi. Oh, Baldi. I went to Seoul with the rifle company. Oh, where else did we go? I couldn't remember the name. They gave. I was recently reading a book on the 5th Regimental Combat Team, which was our outfit, which was put out by Lieutenant Colonel in the uh, Marine Corps. And they listed hill numbers with numbers on them. And God only knows what those numbers meant to me. Because right. they mean beans to me. Okay. I went and, uh, where they called the hill a name. Uh, that's the name that stuck with me. And then not all of them stuck with me. Okay. Uh, I remember certain places, um, uh, I can't remember. I know we were on Baldy one night and then the next night we were over our someplace else. Cause we were, when I was with a fifth regimental combat team, we were what they classified as, a, an outfit, a, a bastardly outfit. We went everywhere and helped everybody. We, we helped the second, we helped the 45th, we helped. All the outfits are over there, just about. Third Division, South Korean Iraq outfits. We supported them. We laid down fire for them. I remember one hill we were on, and they were packing up, I thought. They were making enough noise at night when it was dark. That I went and asked their commander in French, and I could speak French fairly well then. And I asked them if they were going to stay and defend the hill or not. Because it sounded like their guys were packing up. He said they were going to stay. So I went back to my position. Those are the only things I can remember, and I can't remember names. Like I say, I. I was trying to think of the other night, people, some nights, you know, when I wake up certain mornings, I probably could give you a few names uh, because I dreamt of them at night. But to have a name like, I can't, I can't want to come up, Garcia. That's all I knew about Garcia. Okay. It was a little Mexican guy. It was short. And I often wonder what happened to him. Then my radio operator, I can't even tell you all my radio operators I had. Because as a forward observer, I had a, four, a radio operator that operated a radio for me. And I would give him the information, the coordinates and everything. But I can't remember all of them. The only one I can remember is the last guy I had. And the only reason I know is his, I used to call him Digger Odell. He was an undertaker. In civilian life where his folks were undertakers, I don't know. But his name was, it was Polish, and his name was, 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 hmm. I just had it on the tip of my tongue. Oh, 
Kamarowski was his name. And he's the last guy I can remember. Okay. That, that's fine. Um, um, what was it like changing from a rifle company to a mortar company? Well, it meant that I spent more time uh, actually as a forward observer you would just fire and direct fire but I also was a rifleman because I used my rifle as that and my in fact at that time I went from an M1 rifle to a carbine I had an M2 carbine which that is a semi-automatic to a fully automatic rifle. Okay. And I carried three clips. I carried three clips on me. I can remember that. And it was 90 rounds in a clip, I think. I don't know, maybe 30 rounds. I don't know. I think it meant 30 and I had 90 in the three clips. Okay. I, I think that was it. Uh, and that was the biggest difference. I had a bunker that I adjusted fire from which was a closed-in place, not a semi-closed-in place. And that was when the line was stationary. We were at just above the 38 parallel. So I was in a bunker, and I adjusted fire there on the enemy. You would fire right from your bunker? I, w I would fire my rifle, but the mortar could be back. The mortar fire would fire maybe 6,400 yards, okay. and they were back there, and they couldn't see where they were firing, and I would tell them where to fire. Okay. It was like an artillery observer. The only thing, my mortars were closer, and they lobbed the shells in there. But they were actually, a 105 fires the same shell as a 105. 4.2 fires the same thing as a 105, but a different capacity. Okay. Now, did they give you different training in the field to from you learn training? you learn by experience you they didn't train you or anything they just said go up there and take that guy's place and so that's what I want okay I went up there on the front line and I learned from experience adjust and fire but became very proficient and I'll say that for myself I could fire that thing with three up Three adjustments and I was on target. Okay. I can remember one time we lost quite a few people, not the mortar company, but the surrounding areas, and they sent us in reserve. And we went, I know I went to a triple nickel place. That was a, the artillery outfit that was with us. And they were adjusting fire, and I was watching them. <laughs> and the lieutenant says to me, he says, can you adjust that fire? And I says, yeah. I said, I watched them, and I, uh, but I knew how to adjust fire already. So he said, let's see. So I adjusted the fire and told him fire for effect right off the bat. And he says, how did you do that? And I said, I just know from other thing. He says, you know what the lines are in the, in the binoculars? I says, hell no. <laughs> I don't know what they're for. But that was the only thing he asked me. Never talked to me again after that. Maybe he was mad because I adjusted and he adjusted about five times and he didn't hit his target. Could be. Could be. But then I went back to my outfit. Okay. Um. Then when I uh, rotated home, there was another kid with me, and that was after the whole thing. I was I remember I went to the hospital in Tegu. But on the way home, we stopped in Hawaii. The ship lost its crew in a storm there. And the ship commander, I don't know who called, but they called the guy in charge of Pearl Harbor and asked him if we could get off the boat because we didn't have any uniforms. We had our winter uniforms. And we went to 
buyers. And we went around to a different buyer. And went to one buyer and they asked us for ID. And I showed my ID. And there was a kid there that showed his ID and they wouldn't allow him to drink because he was only 20 years old. At that time, the drinking age was 21. And he hit that guy so hard. He says he could be wounded and shot at and everything else. He had the purple heart and everything. And they wouldn't allow him to drink. Yeah. And he hit him. And that started it. And that's where I lost some stripes. That's when my daughter gets a kick out. She says, I don't blame you. I said, well, I spent some time in Brig for it on the board ship. But he hit that guy and it started. But it was well worth it. And you got in and defended the guy? I sure did. He started it when we got in and helped him. And we spent a little time in the break. I remember that. Yep. But that was on the way home. Well, I know I was on Harry when I got hit. And then I carried the guy who got my bronze star off White Horse. We were being shelled and the guy got wounded and I picked him up and I carried him on my back to a safe position on the reverse slope of the hill. They called the medics and then we returned back to, to my position. I don't want to borrow bronze star for that. And for that, in a dollar and a half or two and a quarter now, you get a cup of coffee. That's all they're worth. And I don't know where any of them are. And you know, it took them years later that the Korean company or people could award the Americans a medal for their combat duty. And I remember I used to have to, I sent in for, I had to send a copy of my 214 form and where I was stationed and everything. And I had to, they sent me that medal. I don't know where it is. That one there gone too. So was that the time that you were injured? Or was that a different time? That was a different time. Would you like to tell us about that? I was, I don't know what happened. And they took me on the board of a train. They brought me down to Seoul. And they put us in a large building. They took care of me there. And after they took care of me, they sent me down to Tegu and I recuperated in Tegu. And then I returned back to my outfit. What, um, so you don't remember what happened on the field? For, or were you shot? In the well, I, I remember that we were on Outpost Harry. And that was a, one of these stupid moves that hold at all costs. We held. I was taken off the hill and I don't know what happened to me. Truthfully. I know I would bled a, a little bit. But they took me down and they wrapped me up. They taped me up and put me down to Tegu. By the time I got from there, I went by down to Seoul. And Seoul, I went to Tegu. And then back to my outfit. But I, you know, I don't even know how I got back to my outfit. I, I think today, and that... Tegu was way in the south, and I had to go way up north. Well, but I don't know how I got up there. How long did they keep you in the hospital for? <sighs> you know, I think it was... I'm trying to figure out the time. I know I spent some time in the hospital in Seoul, and then I spent some more time 
down in Tegu. And I don't know how much time there was in there. But I know down in Tegu was the longest stretch. And it's probably about a week okay. down there. But I don't know what the other times was. And uh, when you got your bronze star, would, that, um, would you mind talking a little bit more about that? Well, we were on White Horse. That, I remember that hill. We were on White Horse. And I don't remember the guy. He was a Ford observer for another platoon. And he was wounded. And I don't know how he got wounded, but he got wounded. And I tried to bandage him up. I bandaged him up, or his medic did. And we tried to get through on the phone, and we couldn't get through. And I picked him up, and I carried him down through the trench line, down to the reverse slope of the hill because the artillery couldn't fire over there. The enemy artillery couldn't fire that. And I put him into a, a bunker hole in the backside. And he stayed there. And that, I got him all set, got him ready, gave him a radio and everything. And I said, are you all right? And he says, yeah, I'm all good here. I said, if they push, I'll pick you up on the way by. And I went back to my outfit. And that was the last I seen of him. And he must have told him what happened because they awarded me the, the medal. Oh, okay. He must have told him because I never said a word. Because to me, it was in a day's work. Right. Can I call it work? It was one of the operations we had and I had to I just did it. It was under operations, and that was it. We didn't worry about it. We all watched everybody's back. Um, what was it like on the front lines? Hell. When Saint, we go to see St. Peter, we'll tell St. Peter. We either can't go to hell because we served in hell already. When you had 1,000, 2,000 enemy charging you, it's hell. And the Chinese came into the war and they came in groups. They came in groups. They were thousands of them. They attacked us on, they say on Harry, there was up to 3,000 of them. I don't know. I never counted. I didn't care. I was there. Then I was going to get the hell out of there. And they took us off the hill, and we still held the hill, and the Greeks relieved us. And the Greeks, I don't know what the Greeks did, how did the Greeks did it, but they held it at the end. They were crazy anyway. They were crazy fighters. They were good. The Chinese? No, the Greeks. Oh. The Greeks were good. Oh, they were good. I remember one time we were on, and I can't remember what hill we were on, but they were off to our right, and they were on a hill, and they built a fire, dumbbells. And a couple rounds of enemy fire came in, it turned quiet, they went out, they had to pull them back, because they were trying to hold a steady line. Those Greeks were great fighters. Was there any anybody else there with you? It was you guys and the Greeks there? Oh, there was no. There was third division that was with us at that time. Uh, they're all Americans, but I don't know of any there south. And I know at a time I were out with that rock outfit, and then we were off. Seen some British come over, their British planes. But I can't remember them all. Came to the States, didn't have any stripes on then. But we had a good time. I've only had days left. So it didn't matter to me anything. I was going to get out and stay out. 
How did you stay in touch with your family while you were over there? Very seldom did we I write home. I wrote home uh, probably once. In fact, one time I wrote about four letters and mailed them a different time. But my mother used to write to me about every other day. Okay. She used to write, and I'd get a little, sometimes I'd get three, four letters. I'd get different letters down to them. And you said your brother had served in Korea as well? He did. At the same time? Or? No, he served from 50 to, to the end of 51. And you were 52 to 53? Right. And he was in the army as well? He was an infantryman with the 2nd Division. Okay. He was another sergeant. Okay. He's buried in Ireland. That's a great honor. Um, so you, you had the sea rations, you said. How, would, how were they? Well, they were pretty good, considering uh, for food. They were canned goods. And you had pork and beans, you had hot dogs, and you had uh, spaghetti and stuff. Yeah, I always had crackers, and I always had cigarettes. And at that time, time, I smoked. And that was great, because you got a pack of cigarettes every day out of your sea rations. And they had uh, all different food. You could warm them if you had a chance. You could uh, eat them cold. Uh, you didn't need a fork or a uh, knife or anything. You, ate it, you had a spoon, and you had the spoon. And if you couldn't eat it with the spoon, it wasn't worth carrying. And I had, I learned to drink coffee, black coffee over there. When I used to be drinking coffee with my mother, I used to have sugar in the bottom of my cup when I finished. But over there, I learned to drink coffee. If you got a number 10 can and you put coffee grinds in it, put water and heat it over an open fire somewhere and then let the grind settle by putting a little cold water on top and sip it off. That's how I started drinking black coffee. And what is a number 10 can? Number 10 can is a round can probably. It's a big can that you get. I don't know where you would get them today. You'd probably get them at a, hmm, I don't know. They're probably six inches across center. Okay. And they're about, uh, maybe they hold uh, two quarts. And that was a number 10 can. And that's what you heated your coffee in. Yeah. Coffee in, okay. Um, did you always have enough supplies? Uh, ammunition was brought up to us on a daily basis and had ammunition. Uh, you had what you had on you, and they used to have bandoliers of ammunition. Uh, they were cloth things that ammunition used to be put in to bring up. So you, and they were worked like a, a, a bandolier, and you put it over your shoulders. And as much as you wanted to carry, that was heavy to carry. So you carried it. Okay. But my carbine, my carbine, I had uh, two clips, two sets of clips. And there were 90 rounds. I was at 30 rounds in each one, 30, 60, 90. And they were have two up like this and one down like that. And they just flip them over, tape them together. Okay. Did you also carry a pistol as well? Or? Only when I got one from a Chinese guy that didn't need it anymore. He was laying there and he didn't want it anymore, so I took it. Didn't have much ammunition for it, but... In fact, I gave the pistol away to somebody else. It was made like a, a Luger, and I didn't want anything, any pistols or anything. And when I come home and I went to work for a company and I collect a lot of money, I one place I would talk to a guy, I said, geez, I have all this money. And he gave me a little pistol to carry, and I said, I don't even want it. At that time, I had small kids around the house. I was married, and I says. I don't want any around the house for them to even have. Oh. So you never ended up owning a gun afterwards? Never owned a gun. Never owned a gun, never wanted to own another weapon as long as I lived. And now I wonder. But I live in a nursing home and I don't need it up there. They get up to the, I'm on the fourth floor. 
They got to go through all the floors. Yeah. Um, did you ever feel pressure or stress while on the field? Yes. Yes, I did. And that pressure and stress is still bothers me at times. As a disability, I have disability pension. I'm a disability disabled veteran, 100% disabled. I still have pressure. I think of it. I have chatter. I have frozen feet. I've frozen. That was one thing I've had in Korea. I froze my feet, my fingers. We didn't have the shoes and things. And when we did get shoes that were worth anything, you sweated and they froze when you stopped moving. So, and I think of it a lot of times today. And like I was saying before, sometimes I wake up at night with a thing. I'm in a bunker, cover the door, I'm hollering. You know, so. I have stress then and I have it now. Because at that time it was actually happened and I told the guy to do something, I expected him to do it. You know? And that's how you dealt with it. Yeah. And one thing is this, I never told a man to do anything that I wouldn't do. I would always tell, if I was going up a hill, he was coming with me. I never said, go up there and get him. We'll go get him. Right. Was there anything special that you did or carried for good luck? For good luck and for a thing, I prayed to God to keep me alive and get me home. And when I was places where I could go to tent to go and get, we had chaplains there and they would say mass and the things. There. I was Catholic and went to mass at different places. And I promised that I would do all I could when I come home and I would go to church. And I'd been there. And I know my kids were a lot of times we were camping. And we had to travel distance to get to church, but we still went. And I made the promise. Right. And that was my good luck trial. And he's the one that kept me alive. Um, now these, these masses, were they set up in the middle of the field? Or? No way. They were set up on the side of a hill someplace. The guy had roof of the Jeep or on the ground. Gave general absolution off. And go, go, I can remember. One mass we had, one place and the guy who was, gave us general absolution and said, go, the mass wasn't even done. Because the enemy was coming? Yeah, to get up there and defend. Um, did he ever have time to give out communion as well? Or? Oh yeah, he always had general communion. Even if he had no mass, he'd come out, pass out communion. They were good. Um, they had more than a Catholic chaplain as well. Oh, yeah. 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 They had all different ones. But I can remember one, only one chaplain I can remember. And I, the only reason I know that is I read it in the book. And he was our chaplain at that time, Father Bull from Chicago. He was a nice guy. <laughs> Yeah, and he was there. He was around all the time. I can remember one time, the first time I met him, he says, my name is Father Bull, and I don't want you to put the last part of it on it. That's how I remember him, and I saw it in the book. Didn't say that in the book, but I remember him. Yeah. Um, now, did you ever get a chance to see a USO show? Ah. Oh. Yes. We we're in reserves and where was it? And don't ask me who they wore. Because I don't remember who they wore. We sat there, I sat there with a rifle between my neck like this. I was, that was, I was in the infantry then. Carried a rifle. And I, all I know is that we got back there and they came in and they put on the show, went back there. 
And she said, the girl come out there and says, I'm so proud to be here and that's all I remember about her. I don't know who it was. I can't remember who it was. So it wasn't Bob Hope then? No, it wasn't Bob Hope. It wasn't Bob Hope at that time. It could have been Marilyn Monroe. Could have been almost anybody. Okay. What? Well, I can remember them. She just was on stage, did nothing else, and said, I'm so proud to be here. That's all I remember about the whole thing. The whole show. That's all I remember about the whole show. Uh, I'll never forget that one. How did you guys entertain yourselves? <laughs> the time, we didn't have much time for entertainment. You have to remember that it's a bunch of fellas on the side of a hill or on the top of a hill somewhere's waiting and if you are pulled back you're on a reverse slope of the hill you probably were half a mile a yard mile back further and there wasn't much to do except sit there And I didn't play cards. I've seen guys that would play cards. And I take that back. I take that back. I did play cards once. But I didn't know what I was doing. So, and we were in old artillery bunkers. Because there was bunkers on each side and there was a place for the artillery piece there. And we were sitting there and we were playing cards. And I don't know why I played. Because uh, I don't know if we were playing cards or shooting crap. But I think it was shooting crap because the guy says to me after, he says, you know, there's only one way to make a three. I didn't know how to play. Yeah. So I played. That was it. Okay. Um, did you ever get a chance to go on leave? I went to Japan and R&R &R one time. And that was rest and recuperation. And we called it intoxication. And we had, you could buy a quart of Canadian club for a dollar. And you get a bottle of Canadian Club and drink a bottle of Canadian Club. And you guys were there for a week or? Five days. It was time to go over and come back. They flew us over and flew us back. Did you see much of the country or? No, I didn't. Truthfully, I didn't see any part of the country. I seen the place where I zeroed in the rifle, and that was it. That was the one I was first going over, I zeroed in the rifle. Okay. But the rest of the country, I didn't see anything. I didn't see, and like I say, the country, most of the country I seen, I would give you two cents for. Today, I look at photos of it, and I don't know where they got all of that thing. Because I don't know how big Korea is, and it wasn't that big to me. We crossed, we walked it, we did everything. And I didn't think it was that big. Florida maybe, as big as Florida, maybe across, I don't know. You know, and so, all the country I seen wasn't worth anything. I never went on leave in Korea, because we didn't have leave, we were brought back for rest. We were brought back probably, like I say, a mile back from the front line to rest it. If you had two days, or if you were waiting for replacements, you were waiting for replacements, and as the replacements come in, you got up, but you just laid there, rested there.
Um, do, do you recall anything particularly humorous from your time? Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I remember one time we were, and I don't know where we were again, but we were in reserve. <laughs> and I'm trying to think of the guy's name. He must have been shell shot because he dressed up in his uniform. He took his rifle and he went and captured the colonel from our outfit. That was the last I seen of him. And that was pretty funny at the time. Yeah. You, know, you see him walking down with the colonel in front of him and him with his rifle. Um, did you guys prank each other? No. Not whatsoever. What did you think of your fellow officers and servicemen? Uh, most of the officers were well. Uh, as a forward observer, I didn't have that much to do with the officer because he was in back with the mortars, fire directions. And I didn't see him that much except when I came back. So I didn't have that much to do with him. You know. right. uh, I do remember one time that uh, we were taken back and I don't know where it was again. Where See, I have no recollection of the country itself except where I was going at that time. And I know he brought us back in this place where we were on the side of a hill. There was a stream running down it. And we were waiting for replacements. And he says, uh, tonight, fellas, today we're going to have a beer party. You know, for, uh, a, a truck we used to call 4x4, four four, which was a truck. I don't know what you would call it. Two quarter. No, I'm going to that. And he put the beer in the brook. He brought all this beer. And he says, drink it up, fellas. And I did. <laughs> and I remember the guy saying, you have Sergeant of the Guard tonight. I says, I do. <laughs> and that was the humor I had because he tried to sober me up. <laughs> it didn't work. And then you still have to... Then he stopped. And I tried to run me sober and that didn't work. Huh. But I had, uh, I had that, and that was one of the closest times I had with the officers. Except one time when they, they got these new guys in there, and they zeroed in their rifles in the van, and the guy come up the next day and he says, your rifles are all dirty. They didn't realize that rifles sweat after you've been firing for a day. They sweat. Yeah. So you had to clean them all again. <laughs> but that was about the only times I had. Okay. Um, so where were you when your service ended? I was discharged from Fort Devens, Massachusetts. How long did they keep you at Fort Devens? Three days. Okay. So I came home. I don't know, how did I go back? I don't know how I went back. It was three days, or three or four days, that was about it. Because then I went home and I was out of the service, so... I was discharged. That was it. I don't think I was there more than four days. Okay. And you just had to essentially wait your time out there, right? Uh, yeah. Except one time there was going to be some close order drill. That's marching. And there was this 
private was to go to marches. And I wasn't about to march, to be marched by a private. So that was the closest we come. And there was some other, there was sergeants in there, other sergeants. They went out and marched, so I wasn't going. I was getting out anyway, I didn't care what they did to me. So what happened? They just told me to take off another stripe, so I ended up with a corporal. That's when I got out, I was a corporal. I didn't care. They could have broke me down to civilian. I was going out as a civilian anyway. Right. So it didn't matter to me. Uh, what was your homecoming like? My homecoming life, I hung around for a long time and I didn't leave. Of course, I drank quite a bit. I didn't know my wife when even then. Uh, I drank quite a bit. And I went through a lot of money in a short period of time, and I said, this has got to stop. So I went to work. Where'd, where'd you end up working after you got out? Stanley Home Products. I went to work at Stanley Home Products. I went to work there. Okay. And I worked there, and I bought a car, I bought a new car, and I bought a 54. Buick that came out then, and <laughs> I was still drinking, and there, we used to drink at night, and then Friday nights we'd go out to the thread basket that was out in Southampton. One of the guys that I knew was in the service, and he had to go back to New York, and he was going to go to Fort Dix, he was going to go to Germany, and the other guy who worked at Pratt Whitney, and I, I says, uh, so one of them said, what do you say we go to New York? So we left for New York. We got as far as Southwick and took a telephone pole down. That was the end of my 54 Buick. Well, well, that was life, I think. And then after, I met my wife, and that was the best thing that ever happened to me. And I started straight, I straight, she straightened me out. And we've been married for 58 years now. We've been, she went to nurses training and I had three years of nurse training at Mercy Hospital in, Ho in Springfield. And she had to be in at 10 o'clock at night there because they stayed there and everything. So I started going to school. I went to Western New England College in Springfield. And I would pick her up, she'd take my car and go and then I'd come back. She'd pick me up, drop her off, because there was two other guys and three other guys with us, four guys sometime, and we'd drop her off, and then off we'd go home, because sometimes we rode in their car. Um, and you went to college on the GI Bill? Right. Uh, for what? Business Administration. Okay. And? Western New England College in Springfield. After that, where did you go? I went to work for, uh, and then I went to work for Swift, and I retired from Swift, okay. which is, uh, con geez, what is it today? Oh, out in Omaha, Nebraska. Oh. I can't even think of what it says. Since then, it's been traded and sold, and at one time where it was Armour was with them and at the other time uh, National Hebrew was part of them and we used to sell butterball turkeys and brown surf sausage. I used to call on Brazudos in Cheshire, Connecticut and I used to call on uh, Shorefine. I used to call on Allied Growth Shorefine up here, Sweet Life in Suffield. Okay. I used to call on those and I'm retired now. I've been retired now for Hmm, I don't know, 60, no, that would be more than that, 90, 92, uh, somewhere around that, I don't know. Okay. I retired, and my four kids, my oldest daughter is the one Michelle here, that's the oldest, and then I have three more, those are them up there, that's that picture, when they were kids. And now I have four grandchildren, four, three boys and a girl. 
And one of my grandchildren, Zach, is a captain in the Air Force stationed in New Mexico. And he'll be home for Christmas. Oh, the other one lives in Colorado. He and his wife. Zach and his wife lived in New Mexico. And my other grandson is uh, works with FEMA in Washington. And my granddaughters are Michelle is a nurse, uh, Lori's a nurse, and my second daughter is a priest here in Rocky Hill. Okay. At, uh, Episcopal priest. She became an Episcopal priest. And she's in, uh, she lives in Rocky Hill, but her parish is in Conway? No. Out just outside of Manchester. Okay. Next to town after Manchester. Nice. So she's there. So we have a good life now. And we moved into this. We lived in our house for 45 years. And we moved into this uh, Armbrook Apartments, where we live now. And we're independent living. And it made it that we couldn't shovel, we couldn't keep the grass. And my son would do a lot of work, but he has his house to take care of. And I wasn't fair for him. The veterans would come over and fix my house. They'd put a ramp in for me to go in and everything. And right. My walker, because I have a, a wheel walker that's in my car. And Michelle keeps this one here for me. Oh, good. So when I come here, she has this walker for me. I leave mine in the car. Um, did you make any close uh, friendships in the service? That you, you know... I did have friends in the service, but never any that I kept in touch with, you know. I was never one to get into these people and be friendly with them and anything like that. Uh, I had the same thing in high school, college and thing. I made friends, but never thought we were going to go out together or anything. Uh, I have one friend that's in, I made one while we were working, and he lives up in, uh, oh, it's in Massachusetts, way up 495 going towards New Hampshire. And he was in the Marine Corps. And he's about the only friend. And we keep in touch probably once every six months. We'll call, that's about it. Okay. And sometimes it goes a year that we don't call. That's how close we are. Yeah. Um, I played golf uh, when I retired. We used to golf every day, but gradually those people have gone underground. So there's not many of us left. There's one guy that lives in uh, probably about 20 miles, 15, 20 miles from us. And I know him, and he was a World War II veteran, and he's about, he's 90-some years old. The other guy I know is, well, we're not that close, but I know we talk. Right. Um, how did your military experience influence your thinking about war or the military in general? Well, I think... Number war and the different wars in Afghanistan, I don't think they give these people enough training to compensate them and do what they have to do or the proper equipment. Now I can remember as far as World War II goes and on up that we developed a tank in World War II that we had a twister on them. They used to blow the mines up as you went along. I don't see them using this in Vietnam, Afghanistan, or wherever they go, because why are these vehicles being blown up that these things don't set off these mines? Uh, I don't know if they have a different type of mine or what, but how can these guys be called from civilian life, put on a uniform, give them a period of training, sent over there, they come back and they're out, you know? Uh, I don't think we're giving them a proper training. I think uh, I think we should defend ourselves. We should help our allies as much as possible. Uh, 
I think this is the problem that we have. I don't think anybody is giving them the proper things that they need. I feel sorry for them. Um, did you join any veterans organizations? Just the Legion Club. Are you still? No. I'm an active. I'm not an active member. I'm a lifetime member. I've been a lifetime member. And the club does not do this anymore, I understand. Okay. But I am a lifetime member. I've been a lifetime member for I don't know how many years now. And I joined that as soon as I got out, got home from the service. And um, that's what I belong to. Uh, do you attend any reunions? I go down to meetings once in the blue moon because now I'm living in West Hill and the Legion Club's in East End. Uh, the third, third Wednesday or Thursday of the month, they have a spaghetti supper. I try and make those every year month. Oh. And I talk to the guys then. Yeah. And I see guys that come in for my outfit or outfits I was attached to at times. Okay. Because uh, we were attached to the second division for a long time. We are attached to them. And we're entitled to with the 5th Regimental Combat Team, the Red Bar, you can't always find it. We're entitled to wear the pins or outfits that we were attached to. Okay. Um, how did your service and experience affect your life? Uh, the experience made me, I don't know how it would be to, made me stop and think more, made me realize that I'm not capable of doing things because of things that happened to me, uh, that I've become dis a disabled vet. And it, but it made me stop and realize and think about all these people and feel sorry for a lot of them. Is there anything that we may not have covered that you'd like to add? I don't believe there is. I believe that we've covered the situation in Korea. We covered the local people, and I know friends I have. Well, our fire chief in, in town I was, he was a fireman, and he was called to active duty, came back, and that's what I mean about not getting, he was in the Air Force, so. And uh, my granddaughter's boyfriend is in the National Guard. And he's, in fact, he's just went down and been commissioned a lieutenant. And he's going to go out to Oklahoma to learn to fly the jets. And then he'll be back. And after three years, he's going to be back at Barnes Airport. And that's another thing I don't understand. But I think that they do a fantastic job. They're defending our country from Washington up to Canada. And they are good. I think they're fine. I think these are things that made me think, you know, since I've been in the service and had this experience in Korea and uh, fought for my life at times, that uh, I realize what they're doing. And they're doing a good job of it. That's all I got to say. Well, Norman, I'd like to thank you for your service and for the time for this interview today. Well, I thank you for doing this. And uh, I know my daughters, uh, Michelle, because they don't do this in Massachusetts, but I feel, I feel it's a terrific thing to get it out to the people.